I love that these W uh, that these NBA players have consistently acknowledged here the lead that your league has taken. It's been public, it's been consistent, and they have appreciated the fact that you guys were out in front making sacrifices and having your voices heard and and so I think you all should be incredibly proud of that. What's up? Welcome back to Stewie's World. I'm Brianna Stewart reporting live from the Wobble. I'm joined today by two iconic guests, Doris Burke and Holly Rowe. So I guess the first thing that we just jump right into is about the Wobble and the Bubble. How's it going, Holly, in the Wobble? Obviously, you're here. We're, we're hotel neighbors now, but how's it? How's how's things right now? OK, so I just want the people in America to know it's been really, really hard because um you know, you guys were playing every other day. There's games going on. I think in my first 43 days here, I did 32 games and it's been a lot. But then the days that you're not playing seem like they last forever because our bubble is not, I don't think, as nice as your bubble, Doris, maybe. <laughs> you know, we have very nice accommodations. There's not a lot to complain about, but it's very small. And so we and have, I can go like two places. <laughs> there's not a lot to do. Stewie, I, I, yeah, Stewie, I would say uh, it's similar to Holly. You know, the hotel that we're staying in is lovely. And initially the games were coming pretty rapid fire. So there's a lot of preparation, a lot of excitement around the games. Um, you know, we are fortunate that there's a golf course here at this hotel and I do play golf. And I really would be struggling, I think, with my mental health if I didn't have the opportunity <laughs> to go out there and, and uh, get a round of 18 or even some mornings just go hit balls or something. Because I know there's so many Americans out there who are, you know, job insecure or maybe, you know, have lost their job due to the pandemic. So I, I please, I hope people know I'm not complaining, but it is sort of a grind here, a mental challenge. You see the same space, you're eating the same food, um, you're not with your family or your friends. And uh, I know the players are experiencing the same thing. One interesting thing, Stewie, that's come out here, I know that, you know, there are moms and they brought their children to the Wubble, but you've had some coaches here become very vocal. Mike Malone um, in particular, I know we've talked to Brad Stevens, they're struggling without their family. They could tell you it's been 63 days. Uh, I know Holly is very close to her son, Mac, and they spend a lot of time together. She knows I'm, I'm very close with my children. That may be the hardest challenge here for me is, is the absence of my, my, my kids. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, for the coaches here, the coaches are able to um, have their kids and, and even the, the rest of their staff. I don't want to misquote, but I'm pretty sure that's, that's it. I know a lot of us, not a lot of us, not me. I have not gone golfing here. Holly, have you gone golfing? Golfing? I haven't. I have not. Um, but the refs are definitely partaking in the golfing. That's for sure. Doris, can you explain a little bit about the tier system for, for the listeners? Because I was curious before the show, and I think it's interesting that, you know, you're in the bubble, but you're not all in. Right, because Holly has direct access to the floor in the bubble. And obviously, it's critical to what she's doing because I, you know, Holly, I was saying off air to Stewie, you know, one of my challenges broadcasting this is I'm much farther off the floor than is typical. And I've got an inch of plexiglass um, between me and, and the sight lines. And so it's it's interesting. I, in a seating game with the Lakers, I misidentified J.R. Smith and Contavious Caldwell Pope. And I decided to adjust my my the way I was doing it and just say, so, you know, take a beat. Mike Breen and I were talking about like, take a beat. So where I am is, uh, I, I don't, I think my credential color is yellow. So unlike Malika and Woj and Rachel Nichols and any reporter, Cassidy Hubbard, who's, who's been at the, the lead tier with the players, you know, they quarantined for seven days. They did not come out of their room. They were, they're required to test every day at my level. Um, you get tested on Mondays and Thursdays. When you, you know, come here, you have to take a test, go to your room, quarantine overnight till you get the test result. So there is a lot less uh, stringent restrictions in terms of testing um, and access. Um, but the only thing that's similar, I would say, is, you know, you're, you're looking at the same place, the same things. I've eaten a Greek salad with salmon. I didn't even know I liked salmon. <laughs> Greek salad with salmon about 35 times here. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Holly, you know about the seven day quarantine, right? That's, I mean. Yeah, it's, a, that is one of the hardest. Like I thought, oh great, seven days in a hotel room. I'll watch movies. I'll just be chill or whatever. Day three, I was like banging on the window. Like so people outside would wave at me. I'm not joking. I literally would bang on the window because people were walking on a boardwalk. I could see them and I'm like, hello, I'm in here. Like, please don't mm-hmm. forget me. Stewie, any, anybody who knows Holly Rowe knows that getting her to sit still for 15 minutes is a challenge. No. I, I thought <laughs> she better have some adult beverages, a ton of books, and have downloaded every single thing off Netflix because my girl is going to go absolutely nuts. I mean, it was it's like it's like quarantine to the max. Like it is actually insane. And I think even for like for guests that are now coming in, you know, obviously people can have, there was like a new date for guests to come in and they had to go through that seven day quarantine as well on the outside. But the thing is, is is like, Holly, you did four on the outside and three on the inside, right? right. The guests that are coming now do seven outside, which wow. is just like a lot. Yeah, it, and it, it actually helps you mentally to go from one hotel to another because I felt like I was moving. <laughs> I can see people, new people out this window. I wondered how you guys are doing mentally, Brianna, because I think that you guys are playing every day and you have some physical challenges that the rest of us don't have. How are you doing mentally? Um, I think mentally it's, I'm, I'm doing good. I think it, it is a grind. And I think that, you know, like the three of us, um, like I love basketball and I love to watch basketball and play basketball and this and that. So that, that when there's basketball on every single day, I'm like, this is great. I just come home. I watch games. I do this or do that. And I kind of do my day over again. I think that the hard thing is for the people that, you know, need a break from basketball in these bubbles, there's basketball 24 seven. And, you know, I see the same people. I got to do the same thing. You know, there's no really getting away from your team or anything like that. Um, but you know, at the same time, I'm like, wow, it's gone by so fast. You know, in the beginning, it was like, I don't think this is ever going to end. And now it's like, I look up and it's September. You know, I see teams this week. This week, the teams are, are leaving. You know, if you get eliminated, in, excuse me, eliminated from the single elimination, they leave the next day. So like, there's chaos happening in the in the hotel because people are leaving, sending boxes, all this and that. But I'm doing, I'm doing good. I'm, um, I definitely told my teammates like, I'm not riding a bike after this <laughs> for maybe yeah. a year because we have to bike. We have to bike from like the hotel to the gym to the this to the that. And I'm like, I'm tired of my bike. Stewie, Pip. Hi. <laughs> yep. Another storm down here in Florida. Oh, lightning. Weather in the storm. But it's... Yo, this is insane. This is redonk. Yeah, I don't like my oh, bike my either. I'm, yeah, I'm after not breaking riding my bike either. Your arm in multiple spots. I, I think mean, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> I was going to send a bike to Holly's Florida house as a thank yeah. you for letting me use it with my daughter on vacation. <laughs> but after the accident, I said, I don't think that's a good gift for Holly Rowe. Yeah, Holly had a, had a minor accident trying to, to multitask on a bike. I was filming. I was doing, you know, good work for, Brianna, the, Brianna, for the crew. Can, in the can I ask you one more? You because were all, you, you, you were all in. I, I was talking to colleagues yeah, here yeah. in the bubble about this, you know, because we were on the air when your single elimination games were happening. I mean, other than the NCAA tournament, especially in the WNBA, like, you know, what's that? I wonder just what that pressure was like. I was thinking, man, you've worked and worked and worked and you're going to get a one game series. Yeah. Like that's not easy. <clears throat> yeah. I was, um, my first few years in the league, we had, we were in single elimination. And I remember like my first year, we were like um, less than 500. We were like 16 and 18 or something like that. And we were like trying so hard, so, so, so hard to get that eighth seed. Yeah. And it was like, and then all of a sudden it's like, bang, like that's it. You know, one game and that's it. And it, it makes it more exciting, but it's it's tough. And, and like, you see um, even today in the second round, like, people can get upset and, and you don't know what's going to happen in a one-game elimination. Yeah, I remember that game you yeah. lost, Brianna, that was your rookie season in the WNBA playoffs. I did that game. And Doris, you know, she never lost a championship game in college. This is the four-time you know, most outstanding player, the first in history to do that and four straight championships. Yeah. And Stewie, the look on your face, like I actually felt really bad for you when you lost because I was like, she's so unaccustomed to losing. This just never happens <laughs> to her. 
Um, so I thought it was weird. I wasn't a fan of the single single elimination, and then we lost again the next year in the so- single elimination. So that's why you just need the double buy. It's way better. You're automatically in a series, yeah. and you just get ready oh, yeah. to to kind of lock in. Um, I want to talk about like when the bubble was starting to happen. And when there was, like, thoughts of the bubble happening and this and that, were you guys, like, all in? Like, obviously, you were in quarantine since March, and the fact that basketball was coming back, and this is this is your part of your job and, and what you do. If we were going to be here playing, you guys wanted to also be here playing, or what was the thought process behind that? I, well, I'm laughing because I think you know me well enough that I never gave it a thought. I was like, <laughs> I'm all in. You know, like, I had a reporter ask me a question, like, you know, you're coming out of cancer treatments. Are you concerned about your health and your life? And I was like, oh, I guess I should have worried about that kind of stuff. And yet I didn't. Um, I, I was going crazy sitting at home, not going to games. Like my life is sports and it's maybe not the healthiest, but that's who I am. And I'm, I'm learning to not apologize for that. And I was like, I'm in. I think my greatest challenge was I wasn't sure if it was going to get approved or not by the WNBA. So I found out at noon on Wednesday, July 15th, that I was approved to go to the bubble. And I had to report that night. So my greatest challenge was pulling my life together to be gone for three months in just a few hours. So that was that was crazy. And if you know Holly Rowe, you know that she is more than capable and functions maybe perhaps at her highest level in chaos. So I think that packing was probably no problem for her. Stewie. Um, You know, for me, I had COVID, right? And so there was this piece of me that, um, you know, I just thought, number one, I thought I might have some immunity. At the time, some of the best science was suggesting I had some immunity. And listen, I've been playing, coaching, or broadcasting basketball since I was seven. It's really my comfort spot. I take great joy in watching you guys do what you do. It just, it gives me joy. And so, you know, I did have some, I'm not going to lie, though, I, I had some trepidation, right? Like, I, I did not have, Brianna, any of the scary symptoms, the pressure on the chest, um, but I did lose a good friend to this, and um, I was quite sick, and it took me months to get back to normal. So you have the one thought of, oh, maybe I have some immunity. You have the second thought of, you know, this is nothing to be trifled with. And so, um, and then I had some good friends, um, you know, producer, director, who both chose because of, you know, they're a little bit older. They, they both have some things in their world. And so they just decided not to come. And so, you know, when smart people say, hey, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. You think, ooh, you know. But I'm I'm thrilled to have had a chance to be here to document history, and I'm sure Holly's the same. It's it's maybe the most unusual circumstance of my professional career, and I've been really and I would love to know both of your interpretations of this <clears throat> from the basketball side of things. I was blown away at the high level of basketball that was being played, and um, you know the, some of the shot making, the intensity felt the same. And I'm just curious, did you guys get out of the gates? Uh, with the level of play that you expected, uh, just your impression to that. I think that, you know, it was tough. I think it was tough for us to kind of like, you know, come together so quickly. I came home from, came home overseas in March. Like it was like an ASAP thing, like the travel ban happened. And it was like, I was on the next thing to the United States. I couldn't even get to Seattle. I flew to Boston. Like that's, that was where I could get to. And then I had to get to Seattle from there. Um, and then yeah. basketball basketball stopped. And I think that what people don't understand is, is for the WNBA, you know, for us is when we got all 12 of our people together, that was when we got to this bubble. You know, we didn't have everybody in Seattle before then because it was like, you know, we aren't flying charter. We aren't, you know, meeting there and flying here all together and things like that. And we didn't have the opportunity to get on the court together before then. But I think, you know, with with my team, speaking from from Seattle side of things, we we adapt very easily. And I think that, you know, the main thing that we wanted to all do was really make sure that, you know, if we're going to be here, we're going to do our best and do our best to really make everything, everyone get on the same page. We have some new players, but I think it, it definitely took a second. You know, I know these games were, were coming one after another and it took us a second to find our groove, but, you know, we're happy to, to be able to be playing. And I think, you know, what you were talking about earlier, Doris, is we're fortunate, you know, we're fortunate to be here. We're fortunate to have a job where a lot of people aren't able to do the things that they love right now. Um, And we're going to make sure that we continue to take advantage of our opportunities. So my analysis of that would be um, Brianna is coming off an Achilles tear, which is a difficult injury for a basketball player. 
And Doris, yeah. I wish you could be here. I know you're watching her on TV because I see you talk about it. You talk about Brianna Stewart in men's basketball games during the NBA games. And I thank you for that because it draws attention to what she's doing. And it's a miracle. Um, I don't know who tears their Achilles and is better the next season. I, I absolutely believe that you are better, Stewie. I don't know anyone who's ever come back from this injury and been a better basketball player the next season, just a few you know, months later after coming off rehab. So I applaud you. I, I just think it's a miracle what you're doing on the court. And Doris, I know you saw one play that took your breath away. Tell us about that play you saw. Yeah, so so uh, Stewie and I likened it to, to Giannis. It was the play where you get possession and you are at the rim in a flash. And listen, uh, you know, there are still physical differences between men and women. The skill sets have, have caught up to one another, right? But it struck me that in such short, minimal strides, you took possession of the ball and were at the cup. And one of the things, like when I covered you in college, like your length and, you know, your ability to be at or above the rim. And, you know, Gino had been telling us prior to your arrival in stores about some of the things you could physically do. And so like, it's just cool for me to see that it's just cool. And I likened it to Giannis because it's problematic for defenders when you can cover that much ground in a flash and be at the cup, like the pressure you apply to defenses in that kind of circumstance is something else. Like I've told this story before. I uh, I remember doing off a monitor in Bristol every year. They have this NBA and Africa game. They probably won't do it this year, obviously. But you know, I go to Bristol and we call it off the monitor. And and Maya Moore had made a move and makes a free throw line jumper to win a game in the WNBA uh, finals. And I'm I'm in Bristol watching this uh, warm ups in Africa, so a full continent away, right, Stewie, and. I see Chris Paul doing some motions and like warming up, but I'm like, he ain't warming up. He's mimicking what Maya Moore did. And I thought, you know, and I just hear these NBA players and I covered the WNBA for a long stretch of time. And in 1997, the basketball wasn't anywhere near what it is now. The coaching was different. They were trying to shove a college game into a pro season and, it wasn't until like some of the guys who had NBA training knew how to prepare for back-to-backs and the condensed schedule and how hard what you guys do is every day. And I thought my one wish for the WNBA is that the casual fan catch up to basketball people in terms of its appreciation for your sport. Um, and I think that's when, when you know, that next level gets, gets achieved for you guys. And I, I think it's coming. I think that, you know, it's it's kind of like a, Isaiah Thomas says, a slow grind. Um, yeah. I think I think it's coming. I think people are starting to kind of like, you know, forget about the fact that, you know, we're, we're women playing basketball, but we're just playing yeah. basketball and we're women, you know. Right. Um, right. So it's it's coming. And you can tell even here, like the fact that, you know, <clears throat> you guys have, have been able to give us more coverage um, as far as regular season games. You know, we're having the most regular season games aired on TV that we've we've had um, ever and in such a condensed time. I mean, I know it's making Holly uh, work like <clears throat> work like no other, excuse me, especially with the, the 10 o'clock games. But we're um, taking advantage of our opportunity and, you know, continuing to, to kind of do what we do and have the voices on and off the court. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you, you asked me about, you know, how long it took us to get comfortable being in the bubble as far as playing. How long did it take you guys to get comfortable with, you know, the new way of calling games and the social distancing and this and that? And Holly, I'll start with you. <laughs> well, OK, I got in trouble in one of my recent games <laughs> from Asia Wilson and Dierica Hamby because like I have in headphones when I'm working. And, you know, we're usually in a noisy arena and you would never hear what I'm talking about over there on the baseline. And I guess I was doing a report with great energy about their team doctor that hit a half court shot in shoot around. And then they went off to, to go off and set a new franchise record for three point shots in the game. And I'm like, she set the mojo. She had the rhythm. She got this team off to a great start. And I guess I'm talking loud. And so after the game, Asia and Derek had come over to me and they're like, stop 
talking so loud during the free throws. And I was like, oh my God, I'm mortified. I'm so mortified. <laughs> you know, because I, I can't hear that I'm talking loud and there's no one around me. And you know how quiet it gets in the arena during free throws. It's deathly silent. And then I will also say I've had a few mask incidents where some masks fit looser than others. So Doris, I want you to try to imagine doing your job with a mask on. And, and a couple of times I've been like, because <laughs> I'm like, oh crap, my mask is too tight today. I can't, I can't. <laughs> and I'm uh, it's funny. They, they, uh, they, the original plan here was to have this sort of side set where we would do a normal, typical open stand up, do the whole deal. But the NBA saw it, and there there is not a detail the NBA has overlooked. And and when they saw that we would do an open from this sort of ancillary set, but do it without masks, they said, you're either going to do it with masks or you're going to do it between the plexiglass. And so we we just decided to do it between the between the plexiglass. <laughs> and, um, you know, everybody closest to the floor, as you see Malika and, and Rachel and Cassidy and everybody, Lisa Salters, there's... They've had to do it. I, I admire you guys. I have a question for you, Holly. Do you, because you have to wear a mask on the air, Malika actually told me she does makeup from here up. <laughs> I said, well, that's a lot less makeup. My guess is you're a full face of makeup regardless, and you're just washing the hell out of those masks when you're done. Yes, you know me. I won't go anywhere in life without lipstick. I, I remember going in for a recent cancer surgery and the lady said, you have to wipe off your lipstick. And I said, I will not be having surgery without my lipstick on. And she said, we, we have to be able to see if your lips turn blue so we know if you're going to die or not. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess I'll turn, uh, I guess I'll wipe it off. <laughs> Stewie, let me just tell you one story. And this is non-basketball, non-bubble related, but it just captures Holly so well. You know, uh, uh, we go on vacation to France together. I think we were in France. And Holly is driving, I don't know it, what, 80 kilometers per hour, but whatever. She's flying down a highway in a foreign country. And she's putting mascara on in the rearview mirror and driving. And I'm going, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> she's like, I can do this, no problem. I go, the speed and the mascara wand have me quite concerned. So slow the brick down or I'm going to take that wand out of your hand. <laughs> I'm like, was that what you were uh, actually stopped. doing, Holly, when you had the bike accident? You were putting mascara on? No, I was film. I was using my phone. I was filming. <laughs> I did put uh, the mascara down. The tone in her voice let me know I should yeah. put the mascara down. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Uh, so, Stewie, for me, um, I think, you know, the distance from the floor has an impact on me. Um, I One of the things I enjoy most about my job is our proximity to watching you guys do what you do. And I take great energy um, from the players on the floor. And I also try to observe everything. You know, I've, I've often said, you know, when you're scouting a team and you watch them on tape, you're not picking up all the subtle nuances of, uh, you know, players' interactions with one another, players' interaction with the coaches, players' interactions with their opponents. And so that's a real challenge for me is, um, you know, I, I think I have to manufacture more energy because I'm 75 feet off the floor. Um, and again, you know, just taking a beat so I'm not misidentifying anything. Um, so it was a little bit of an adjustment. But again, you know, I think you adapt pretty quickly. Um, you just... You do because you go back to to what we were talking about earlier and that that incredible appreciation for for being here. And I have to say, and I, I'm sure it's the same for you guys, like the logistical challenge and the massive undertaking that putting this situation together for the NBA and for TNT and ESPN. And there's two things that really stand out. And the first is the game presentation, because when I'm watching games on television, I just get lost in the action of that game, particularly if it's a possession ball game. It's no different. You know, if it's a blowout, it's it's less compelling. But I have found myself just losing myself in the action. And the second thing is the ability to keep people safe and well. And um, and both were massive and and both have been, to me, extraordinary here. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we're able to be here and play, be playing is is amazing in itself and you know i think coming here like i didn't think that the bubble would work because i was like i don't know how this is gonna work with all these people you know some people aren't gonna do the right thing 
Um, and that's how our bubble is going to burst. But our bubble is still here, still safe. Um, yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit because I want to talk about uh, the day of reflection. That is what the WNBA is calling it when we did not play on the 26th yeah. and 27th. Obviously, the NBA also didn't play on those days. And we kind of um, made our decision based on that Bucks game. You know, when the Bucks said that they weren't playing and, and it was called a boycott, a lot happened. And and for you guys, I think it was you you were working on the fly. I know, Holly, you were at the gym on the 26th. There was supposed to be um, Atlanta versus D.C., I believe, was the game. And, you know, just just tell us what was going on in that gym and, you know, what you had to do to kind of continue to capture con- content. Yeah, it was, it was probably the most fascinating 48 hours of my career. And it's something I will always remember. And I, I walked into the gym for work. I had my bag over my shoulder. I knew the Bucks had said they were not going to play. But because the WNBA women had already dedicated the entire season to social justice, I wasn't sure uh, that the women wouldn't play because I felt like they were already do- doing so much. And I walked into the gym. And there were three teams standing out on the court under the basket in the free throw lane. The tension in the air was so palpable. I went, whoa, wow. Like this, this is an intense conversation. So I just kind of hung to the edges. And what I watched that day is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen in my life because it took three teams for about 40 minutes. And then um, finally the other team, the fourth team came in. And I just remember thinking, this is tense. Not everybody agreed with the decision not to play. And um, there was a lot of conversation. I would say, you know, a lot of the teams felt like they should play. And the Washington Mystics, I think, were the ones kind of leading that charge of they just did not feel comfortable playing. They agreed to play in that moment. Uh, The commissioner, Kathy Engelbert, came over and she gave them some information on how this could impact the league if they didn't, what the, you know, what the consequences would be. And then they said, okay, we're going to play. We're just going to take a shot clock violation. They kind of had some things they were going to do in the game to bring awareness. And they went back into their locker room, the Washington Mystics, and they, away from the peer pressure of the other team, said, we're not playing. And what I love about the WNBA women is they got, got on board. They didn't all agree. Not every team agreed. And it put pressure on other people because then you had to make up games and you had back-to-backs to finish the season, and it was difficult. Um, but what I loved is how those women came together together And I thought, gosh, if our country could be more like this, like we have heated debate and heated discussion and we don't all agree, but then we come together and we are unified. It was something beautiful to watch. You know, I was sitting in my room, Stewie, and just prepping my next game. I was not scheduled to work that day. I was scheduled to work the next day. What's interesting here is I'm in Orlando. And so NBA TV was actually blocked out in my hotel room. So while I wanted to watch the coverage, I I had to flip on the Orlando Magic Station in order to get it. And so watching their broadcasters try and contend with history that was unfolding and not getting information in real time because they were not in the arena. I just knew it was historic. And I have stood in great respect and admiration for both the players of the WNBA and the players of the NBA. You know, we came down here as broadcasters with three things in mind. And, you know, Holly, I'm sure feels exactly the same way. You know, the first priority as a broadcaster is to document the game directly in front of you. So that's the first priority. But obviously these are incredibly unique circumstances. So the second thing, and Holly, you please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. The second thing is, it is our job to document um, the the quite passionate uh, feelings of both the men and the women players, respectively, because I know that you had hard decisions to make about whether to come down and play anyway, both from a health perspective, but as importantly, from a social justice perspective. So we had to document what we saw from the social justice perspective as the players drove the content. What was important to you guys? And could we tell that piece? And then the third thing, of course, is the unusual circumstance, the historic nature of doing it in this kind of environment. You know, it's not easy to take a stand. It's not easy to be unpopular. You WNBA players know that better than anybody because your history of, of, of fighting for things you believe in is, is long. 
and well documented. And I couldn't agree with Holly more. Like, you know, I could get emotional here, you guys, because, um, you know, what we, I, I saw a poll recently. I am by nature, and I think Holly would concur with this. I am a, by nature a glass half full person. But both of my children have said to me recently, we, we feel something on you that's unusual, right? That the weight of everything that's occurring is is weighing on you. But I saw a poll yesterday, um, I believe it was done by Harvard, and it basically said that you that Americans are more united than they are not. On even issues of social justice, like equality, there's nothing political about equality. There's nothing controversial about equality, whether we are talking race, gender, uh, sexual preference, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with equality, right? We're all aspiring to that. And so, I don't know, that was a long-winded way of answering a question. I think I've started to ramble, but one thing I would also like to say here, um, Brianna, is that I love that these, w, uh, that these NBA players have consistently acknowledged here the lead that your league has taken. It's been public, it's been consistent, and they have appreciated the fact that you guys were out in front making sacrifices and having your voices heard. And, and so I think you all should be incredibly proud of that. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, Holly, I know that you see the video montage that happens uh, before every game and the one that was happening um, last week that was just kind of wrapping up everything that the WNBA has done as far as social justice and um, continuing to, to kind of fight for equality and amplify the message. And I think that, you know, when I think about as a player, like the 2020 season is already going down in the record books. Like that's already going down in, in one for, for the ages. But the fact that, you know, we were able to come together and a, a NBA player said this, I'm not exactly sure who, but when it was like about, are you going to play? Is the season going to continue or what's going to happen? And he was like, you know, our platforms are biggest when we're together. And that's that's exactly true with the WNBA. Our platforms are biggest when we're together. Our strength is strongest when we're together. Um, and I'm just really, really proud of everything that we've been able to kind of make happen um, this season, you know, in such short, short amount of days. And you know, we've we've been learning on the fly. We've been educating ourselves on the fly. I mean, we've been on Zoom calls all the time, but um, putting putting social justice before basketball, and and that was what we wanted to do um, this season in particular. I think it was a really beautiful moment. Uh, so the day after the, the first games were canceled, you know, they took the second day off, so every team sat out a game, and we did a roundtable discussion with the executive committee. But they organized a shot with the with every player in the WNBA, and they were standing on a court together, mm -hmm. uh, linking arms like this. And you know, I, I'm on the on television doing the interview with NECA, and they cut to the shot of every player in the league linking arms, and I lost it. I I just started crying because, I mean, these women have been unified, every race, um, gender orientation, sexual orientation. Um, the unity is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And um, I, I will think that, that that moment with the executive committee and the players on the court, and Stewie, I'd love your side of that. That's going to be one of the proudest moments in my career that we got to put that on television. No, it was. And it was it, it gave you chills, the, the type of feel. Like, obviously, you were at the, the game arena with the, the EC, the executive committee, like you said. And the fact that we were able to – get all the players in the bubble everybody meet at the practice uh court at the same time everybody wear the same shirt you know you know logistics are, are kind of tough to make everybody do the same thing but to be able to see that on tv and see the the video panning from one side to the next when we're all standing there locked in arms it's it's inspiring and just just continuing to to kind of show that you know what we can do, what we can do as a league. And, you know, we're going to make people see what, what we want them to see and, and hear our message. We have a really nice feature that's going to air on SportsCenter tonight that I did for the Undefeated about the evolution 
of activism in the WNBA going back to 2016 and the Minnesota Lynx uh, starting a protest. So if you guys yeah. want to watch that, it's going to be really, really special. I'm going to be tuned in tonight for sure. Um, guys, I have like so many things that I want to talk about. And I know that um, the time is of the essence, but I still want to I want to highlight you two. Um, I think that the paths that you've both taken to, to kind of get to this point, to get to where you are, um, has been incredible and inspiring. And I just want to know, I'll start with you, Doris. When you were coming from Providence, like, did you think, like, I'm going to be here? I'm going to be calling an NBA Finals. I'm going to be the first woman to call NBA Finals. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't even have words. It's yeah. surreal. Uh, it's surreal is what it is. It's I mean, honestly, history. Brianna, no. It's history. Yeah. <laughs> no, the answer is no. Uh, you know, and Holly knows the story, but in college, I was incredibly shy. I had bad skin, bad hair, bad teeth, bad clothes, you name it. And the only place I had confidence, Brianna, was right in between the four lines of a basketball court. And, um, you know, I left coaching. It was a hard decision. I loved my two years as an assistant at Providence, but I was, you know, I was going to be married and I wanted to be a mom pretty quickly. And I really, to be honest with you, like the year I left coaching at Providence, they put Providence College Women's Basketball on radio. You know, we had no listeners. Um, we barely had the proper equipment to, to set up and do the job. And that started in 1990. And um, um, you know, I got really lucky in terms of timing, uh, Stewie, and that coverage of women's basketball at the time was exploding. The formation of the WNBA in 1997 was a game changer for me. Um, because I was in the New York market. I could now make a living full-time doing analyst work with the games, 30 games in the winter, 30 games in the summer. And it's just, you know, as Holly knows, you know, you don't, you enter this business because you love sports and you like telling people stories. For me, it was an accidental entrance into, into, the, into the field. I didn't graduate from a communications program, but, but basketball, again, has always been my passion, my love. Too many times it's probably defined who I am. I've been really lucky. I think Kanali knows this, like as a, as a person in the business, you just put your head down and do the game directly in front of you, whatever that game may, may be. I started the WNBA on radio. The only people who listened to me on WNBA back then in 1997, David Stern put those games. Uh, when you called the NBA office, you would hear our broadcast on the, on the hold line. And I don't think there were many <laughs> listeners besides that. Um, but like, look, I just have been by the grace of God, incredibly lucky. And Holly, I mean, I can I can go through your background too. Um, no, you don't have to. You know, I, me too. I'm, I'm like I got it memorized. I'm like BYU <laughs> to Utah to here bubble wobble. Um, so I think one of the things I'm proud of in my career is I put the very first women's basketball game on radio that ever happened in Utah. And the way I did it was I went to a radio station and got uh, what's called a time buy. So I paid the radio station to put a basketball game on. And then I went out and sold all of the advertising myself and figured out a way to put BYU, Utah, women's basketball on the radio. And it was the first time women had been on the radio for women's basketball in Utah. And so I started figuring out that if I could get the radio station and do the time by and sell the advertising time to afford it, you know, I spend a lot of my own money doing it, but then I got to cover those games. And so I would travel around the country. I did BYU women's basketball for a while. And I remember carrying a kit like this big, bigger than me all around the country. I remember taking a train from Fresno State at a Fresno State game. And I took a train from there to San Diego State for a game two days later. And then I ran out of money. And I remember having to ask a player's parents to drop me off at the airport the next day so I could get home. This is before ride shares. And, and you know, I don't think I even had a credit card. And um, I got those games on the radio and I'm really, really proud of that. I did a game when Cheryl Swoops played at the University of Utah, Texas Tech played at Utah and it was the year they won the national championship. I did that game on the radio. So I'm just proud that I cared so much about it, that I was willing to do whatever it took. I mean, I've done crazy, crazy, crazy things to get sports on TV and I'm still doing it 25 years later and I'm living in the, in the wobble. Th this is a crazy experience. Like my day-to-day -day life here is wild. And I just love that. I'm still passionate about it. I love it. And I care about it. I know a couple of stories from Holly's, you know, early days. I want you to picture just a couple of things. You know, she's trying to make her way in the business and she's working at a radio station and McKylan's an infant. 
And, you know, she's got this obscene, you know, uh, time to be at the radio station. So what does she do? She takes this infant into a car, in a car seat. And while she is doing a radio show, McKylan is, you know, I don't know what the setup was, but McKylan is in close proximity to her trying to do it. When he was a young boy, uh, you know, picture Holly. <laughs> like, I just see this so clearly in my mind. Holly Rowe on the sideline, you know, with McKylan. Uh, you know, on a perch somewhere on the sideline as well, hopefully out of harm's way. Um, but, you know, with some toys, you know, so watching her or hearing those stories, I know for me, I remember doing the New York Liberty and my daughter who can't stand sports. I'm on radio and she's in the press box and she's reading a book during the course of the New York Liberty. I'm just like, well, whatever it takes, you know, it's uh, it's been an interesting journey. So, I mean, you guys are, are incredible. So I think, you know, what I just want to kind of finish with is obviously I'm a I'm a role model to to a lot of, you know, young aspiring people. You guys are also role models to a lot of young aspiring people who, you know, their basketball career is going to stop and they want to continue in and be in the place and, and fill shoes like like yours. You know, for me, it's like obviously I want to continue to to kind of be the best that I can be on the court, but also off the court and continue to set an example in both ways. And I just want to know, like, for from your guys' perspective, how can we continue to to kind of be better? How can we continue to to push equality and, you know, support more diversity in the media? And then my second part of that question is, what would you say to the to the up and coming aspiring Doris Burks and Holly Rose and the people that want to be like you, what, what advice would you give them? Holly, I'll start with you. Okay. So how I can be better is helping people get opportunities. So something I'm proud of, and I hope you don't mind if I share this Stewie is uh, she was sitting out injured last year. You were hurt. And I suggested to my boss, let's use Stewie. Let's put her on a game. Um, I, I think you can be good at it. And she was Doris. She is so good. Like she sees the game the way you see the game. Um, she cares about it. I, I remember watching a game with Doris once and I look over at her and she's gone. She's so lost in the basketball and, and she's gone to this place in her brain. And that's how Stewie is. And you were terrific Stewie in your first broadcast for ESPN. Monique Billings, a player here for the Atlanta dream while we're here in the bubble, she sent me her resume tape and we went over game stuff that she can do better. So when she gets out, she can be an analyst. So I spend a lot of time helping other people and it's often behind the scenes and nobody really knows, but I'm proud of it. And I'm going to keep doing that. I think we've both done a lot of things for people that way. And then I think the other advice I would have for people is you are not going to get paid a lot of money and it's really hard work. And so you better love it and you better go in with the attitude that I'm going to grind and I'm going to do every possible thing I can. Um, And the rewards will come later is kids that get in this and people that get in this to be on TV or to earn money, that ain't it. You, you do the work because you love it and work hard. You know, Stu, you're a role model for a reason, right? Um, you're a role model because you love the game, you work at it, you are diligent, and you will be great and have already been great and carved out this extraordinary career because you're passionate and you work hard at it. And, uh, and I think that's the first and most important thing people need to do. Like, you have to be passionate about this. This shouldn't be about being famous or being on TV. It can't be that. And the other thing I would say, and just to Holly's point about supporting women, you know, I think some people, you know, on the distaff side can feel like, well, there's only so much space for us. Well, that's not true. There is space for all of us. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, you know, we, we understand where women are societally. We, we understand our representation in Congress, in local government, and in Fortune 500 companies. We still have a long way to go. And so it's really important that we support and, and cherish one another's success. So that's number one. And I would say the same word Holly used, grind. There's no job too small. You know, when I did Providence College Radio back in 1990, I did 16 games, I think. And I, I can promise you, the only, the only person who was listening was my family, like nobody else cared, but, but I was growing with every repetition. And um, you know what I so appreciate about women of your generation is how confident they are and how self-possessed. And just, it just gives me such joy to know 
that your generation is going to take us to a place we haven't been before. We we are the way, my generation, we are the way that we are because of, of you guys and, and having you guys as role models. So um, thank you for that. So favorite, you answered this already, both of you, but favorite wobble bubble moment? Well, I, I mean, funny wobble bubble moment. Um, I think we had a pretty heated phase 10 and a lot of people were drunk. I won't name any names who was involved with that. You skipped um, me like a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty fun. Um, but I think, you know, like I, like I told you, that shot of the players, and, and one day I'll tell you how we got that shot, but it was with my TVU unit um, and to rope in help. Like it's a miracle we even got that shot on TV, but that's my favorite moment and probably will be for my whole career of all the players standing linked arm in arm. You know, I think my favorite moment might actually, uh, you know, just be sitting in my hotel room um, and watching the Milwaukee Bucks make their decision and watching his history unfold right in front of my face. You know, that was just absolutely incredible. And again, you know, I, I am always looking and grasping for reasons for hope. And the fact that young people care as much as they did here and do there with you gives me great hope for the future. Um, who are going to be the NBA and WNBA champs? If you guys had to pick, I know this is like putting you right on the spot this because I'm right here. Awkward. Sorry, it's in my rapid fire. So if you don't think it's me, just say it. Doris, you go first. <laughs> well, I, it's hard for me uh, watching his history to, to uh, underestimate the power of LeBron James. So, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but LeBron James's history is pretty strong. <laughs> Hey, this is awkward, but I think that Las Vegas is the team to beat right now. Don't get mad at me, but they just beat Seattle twice. They are playing great. Their bench is the best in WNBA history right now. Um, do I think Seattle can beat them? 100%. I think that depends, you know, on the health of Stewie. Could you give us an update on your foot and Sue Bird? And then um, I also think that the LA Sparks and Minnesota are kind of outliers that can beat anybody. So Candace Parker has played the best I have seen her play in five years. Like I, I am so proud of that woman. 13 years into her career, she is balling out 15 points, nine rebounds and five assists a game, like, and defensive player of the year for the Associated Press. So just shout out to her, the LA Sparks behind her will and grit. That could be interesting too. Yeah. People are balling in the bubble. Okay. Two Who more. do you think? No, <laughs> put yourself on the spot. I mean, duh. Like, I think we're going to win. <laughs> um and on the men's side i mean the lakers the lakers look tough right now and i think i mean i know miami just beat the celtics but the celtics are they got the young core and and they're good and they're yeah. fun to watch okay first thing you're gonna do once you leave the bubble doors go home and walk on the beach near my home in rhode island and holly exactly the same go home and walk on the beach near my home in treasure island <laughs> okay and this is my last rapid fire question. If there will be a bubble next year, will you both be signing up? No question. <laughs> <laughs> you know I will, but I need to escape this one first so I can get my mental game back on point. I know, I'm just trying to like be prepared. <laughs> you guys have your teammates and you have friends here and Doris, you have colleagues. I am here by myself. Yeah. Like it has yeah. been really challenging, but you know me, of course I'm signing up. Of course I've I also am. Seen, I've also seen the selection of wine bottles your friends have sent to you. So <laughs> I have also seen that too. That's a wrap for Stewie's world. And I just wanted to say thank you to Holly and Doris. You guys were amazing uh, as always. And love, love chatting with you. As a parting Stewie, thanks gift. Thanks for having us. Woo! I'm going to send you this, Doris. This is the new merch from Stewie. Yes, I just got this my is... Diana Taurasi goat shirt. And Diana, no disrespect, Stewie, Diana all time is my favorite player ever. But I'm all about the swag. And Stewie, you know I loved covering you. You're a badass. So thanks for having us. For <laughs> sure. Thank you, guys. For the fans out there, make sure to subscribe to the Uninterrupted YouTube channel for more episodes. We'll be checking in throughout the WNBA playoffs, so stay tuned for more conversations from inside the Wubble. For audio podcast listeners, subscribe to Stewie's World Feed wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brianna Stewart. Stay tuned for more Inside the Wubble on Stewie's World. 
Get involved. Contact Attorney General Daniel Cameron and demand justice for Brianna Taylor. This message is brought to you by Brianna Stewart, Uninterrupted, and a generation on the right side of history.